for 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 for, for inviting me and and I I don't want to disappoint you very much because from from Anna's presentation it sounded like uh, you know so, uh, like an introduction to somebody po politically very interesting. Well, what I'm going to present today will be uh, a, a summary of uh, quantitative research, but I think that the topic of this research is, is highly relevant, uh, and it, it is, uh, to some extent, it is political, but I really hope that uh, these findings can get some acceptance uh, um, among people from, from different parts of the, of the political um, Ideologies from different from different uh, different political views. Uh, so I want to rather focus on the process, which I think is a consequence of uh, how we consume uh, media today, and what are the uh, big changes in the way we we function today in our um, uh, internet environments rather than than, than offline environments. So um, uh, let's first focus on the, uh, how media report. Um, uh, important social issues. For example, the emigration uh, uh, to uh, Europe from the Middle East, from Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, okay. This is uh, something which has been uh, widely debated in 2015, and you probably remember newspapers uh, showing this picture of uh, Aylan Kurdi, um, a boy who was uh, uh, found um, uh, after, after trying to, to escape from the war zone. Uh, to Europe, uh, and and this was uh, basically he died on the on the on the sea, and these kind of images in newspapers raised a lot of emotions, uh, and of course a part of the images there were articles, and uh, in traditional media, in traditional newspapers, you would um, normally know who is the author of the article and what are the constraints of what can be expressed in in such articles. Now, uh, most of us already in 2015 didn't get most the the, the, the information about this issue from newspapers. Uh, much more common was the knowledge which we gained from um, from uh, online media, uh, like this website, website of Fox News, uh, which is the right wing leaning uh, uh, website and, and and television, of course. Uh, but when they reported such such uh, issues, like for example, people uh, dying trying to escape to to to, to Europe, uh, the reporting was was rather neutral. And if you read this this article, it's again an article about refugees who were who died uh, on, on, on a shipwreck uh, that tried to access uh, Europe. Now, the difference between this reporting and the reporting in a traditional uh, uh, newspaper or, or television is that here, a part of this article, you also have comments. You have a commentary section. And below in these comments, you can see such comments like this one. Uh, somebody who reacts to an information that there are 20 billion more to go or somebody writing that there are 500 potential terrorists the world will not have to worry about. Um, another user with a very um, significant nickname, SS Totenkopf, writes, that is such a tragedy, a tragedy that only 500 are feared that I was hoping it was a lot more like all of them. This is the reality which um, I'm not sure how um, common it is in France, but, uh, but in, um, in, in American media, in Polish media, in Israeli media, um, I, I commonly see uh, hundreds of such comments below any article um, that is focusing on the issue of, of uh, immigration, of refugees, uh, um, and uh, always you see um, that many comments are actually a kind of addition to an article. So what you see on a, on a news website is not only the article, but also contents that are produced by the users, and these are completely unconstrained, these are completely not, not moderated content. So the question which, so, and, and of course, uh, ultimately, uh, this is not only, uh, this is not only um, uh, social media, this is not only a uh, news website, but it's also politicians who, increasingly uh, more often use this kind of language. And the um, president of the United States, uh, Donald Trump, has uh, expressed such statements, derogatory statements about immigration several times. These are some examples of dehumanizing statements that he used about, uh, about immigrants, uh, whom he calls uh, always illegals, uh, uh, people who are not human, et, et cetera, et cetera. And now the question is how the fact that we are exposed to such um, language coming from politicians, but also coming from, from media, 
affects our uh, uh, our attitudes and and our uh, uh, political views and our uh, our virtues and our emotional life. Um, uh, also, uh, you see that this same language which we see on the internet in uh, the form of comments below uh, uh, articles, uh, the ones we hear also from politicians like Donald Trump. We also see in the either letters or the online entries written by terrorists themselves. So these are some examples of attackers who were uh, who committed crimes uh, in different places in the world, um, attacking uh, synagogues, attacking mosques. Um, and always uh, you can hear them expressing in social media uh, this the same uh, language of hatred against uh, against immigrants and also linking different different uh, minority groups to the problems of immigration. So um, my uh, first uh, 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 hypothesis, which I wanted to, to test, was whether it is true that when people are moving from the old media to new media, so when we are switching from the old good newspapers and television to um, uh, social media as a main source of, of, of information, we are actually uh, becoming uh, 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 more, uh, we, we are starting to normalize hate speech and we are, uh, and th th this might change also our, our views. So um, where do people get, get their information from? Uh, of course you have, uh, you have um, uh, news, uh, television, uh, news broadcast, then uh, of course newspaper in different countries still they are a valid source of information, uh, radio. These are the three traditional channels of, of, of uh, media communication. But, um, you know, of course, people talk about politics. So from daily talks, daily encounters, we get a lot of information about, um, about political life. But now there are such websites like, for example, Breitbart News, which is, um, uh, which is an uh, online news website, which is not connected to any television or anything else. Mm, but it's uh, the, the way it operates is only online, and uh, the quality of, of, of news which is provided there was very often questioned. There was a lot of fake news, a lot of misinformation there, and uh, also a lot of hate speech uh, or, or instigating to hate speech, like in the case of this article. And this news website played an enormously uh, important role uh, in the uh, election of the pre of the of the uh, of Donald Trump as the president of the United States. Um, and of course, um, we have um, social media and politicians are using more and more often uh, social media when communicating with their audience. Uh, so we, we get a lot of uh, information about politics from, from Twitter, from, from Facebook. And something uh, entirely new, which is a citizen journalism. So uh, we all become journalists in some situations. So when we see something very important happening around us, we can, we can, we can take our phones and record what happens around and, 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 and then transmit it online, stream it, um, on on um, on internet, and and this is the way we can we can also um, somehow uh, become uh, journalists ourselves. So there's a lot of there are a lot of streamers uh, who are regular people, not trained journalists, who are uh, transmitting uh, information through um, online media. And when we we did one study in which we asked um, uh, Polish participants where do they get their information from. So uh, we gave them several options. So we asked them whether they get their information from television, from newspapers, from radio, whether they did it from word of mouth, so by talking with other people, or rather this is online news websites, social media, or online citizen journalism. And we found that there are these three types of users. So um, the green line represents people who are, uh, who are uh, 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 just, consuming every, uh, they're highly immersed uh, users. So they are, they are um, uh, just uh, uh, using a lot of media, highly engaged, uh, engaged uh, um, media users. So these are people who are very often watching TV, reading newspapers, listening to radio, also talking a lot about politics, but they're also watching uh, uh, online websites, social media, uh, citizen uh, journalism, they consume all of that. Now, uh, the blue line represents people who are traditional media users. These are more often older people who are still uh, watching a lot of TV, they are reading newspapers, they are listening to radio, but they are not uh, using social media as their social source of information. They are not following uh, uh, citizen journalism. Uh, so these are people who are more getting their information more from, from traditional um, sources. And then uh, the red line, 
are people whom we call uh, digitally immersed. So there are people who are these are people who are not uh, watching TV anymore. They are not reading newspapers. They are not listening to radio. Most of their information comes from online journalism, from social media. So they're they are, they are talking about politics, of course, with other people. So they're they're informed in terms of politics, but they're informed mostly through online uh, online media. And then we compared these three groups because we wanted to see uh, whether three groups we presented them with examples of hate speech. We presented them uh, the examples of, of a hate speech that we took from uh, from from the media, and we asked them. To what extent do they think this kind of language is acceptable, or maybe this kind of language should be banned, should be prohibited? So we found here that people who are using um, mostly social media, their level of acceptance of uh, of uh, uh, Islamophobic uh, hate speech is much higher than among traditional media users. The highly engaged people, so people who are using all kinds of media, are also more accepting of anti-Muslim uh, hate speech than people who are most using mostly traditional media. And finally, we also measured the levels of Islamophobia. So uh, uh, we presented uh, some statements that are clearly Islamophobic statement, and we asked to what extent people agree with this statement. And here we again found that um, people who are uh, watching mostly uh, online uh, uh, sources of information um, and, and people who are, among others, using also social, uh, also this social media, uh, apart from watching TV or listening to radio, radio, these people express uh, significantly higher levels of Islamophobia than people who are user, users of mostly using traditional media. So here we we tend to find that, that using a certain form of media is somehow related to people's uh, prejudice and to people's uh, attitudes uh, toward hatred. And in a, in a more complex model, we uh, found that actually those people who are uh, using more uh, digital media rather than traditional media, these people uh, tend to consider hate speech as more normal. They are accepting it because they think it's, it's more normal. It's not something which, which should be banned, which should be prohibited. And this in turn makes them more prejudiced. This in turn makes them more uh, Islamophobic. So uh, uh, this is uh, one study in which we tend to find that because of switching from traditional media to online media, we are becoming more accustomed, more normalizing the, um, uh, the uh, prejudiced hate speech. And, um, and, and this is only some evidence. Another form of evidence which we found for that was something that we, uh, a, a large study that we've done in 2014 and 2016. We, we were cooperating then with uh, uh, Stefan Batory Foundation in Poland, and this allowed us to collect uh, data from representative uh, uh, sample of 1,000 adults in Poland, and also to access more than 600 young people, adolescents, uh, in the age ranging from 16 to 18 years old. So we had a study of adults, and also a large, sur large scale study of young people. Uh, and then we came back to these people in 2016, and we also surveyed identical sample of more than 1,000 adults and also more than 600, uh, 600 uh, adolescents. And these are reports that are accessible online, which you can, you can find from this research. I want to show only few results from this study. We asked uh, our participants, whether they have encountered hate speech on television. So we presented them with some examples of hate speech and we asked those participants, uh, the hate speech was directed toward different groups. So we presented uh, anti-Semitic hate speech, Islamophobic hate speech, anti-Gypsy, anti-Roma hate speech, racist hate speech, anti-Ukrainian hate speech, homophobic hate speech. And we asked whether they have seen something like that on TV in a, in a recent uh, period of time. So in 2014, 25% of Polish adults declared that they have seen anti-Semitic hate speech on the internet. In 2016, two years later, it was already almost 40% that declared that. Uh, among, uh, the same was true about Islamophobic, even more. 22% uh, uh, declared that they have seen Islamophobia on television in 2014. In 2016, almost every second Polish person 
have declared that they have seen um, Islamophobic uh, hate speech. Now you can see very similar change among young people. Also, the increases are in case of any form of hate speech. So you see the increase, the increase was, was highly visible in, in, in any case. Um, and such increases we very rarely observe in survey studies that from that within two years you have such an increase uh, of, of any anything. And here we can see how much more of hate speech there was uh, in television uh, between 2014 and 2016. Uh, same is true about internet. Also, increases are highly visible in all cases, but it's particularly among young people because young people spend much more time on internet. And this is the primary source of, uh, of hate speech for them. So in 2014, for example, we, we asked whether they have seen anti-Semitic comments on the internet and, and 56, 58% of Poles said, uh, young Polish people said, yes, we have seen them. In 2016, it's already three quarters, 74%. Um, the same uh, uh, about Islamophobic, it is rise until up to 80%. So almost every young person, every teenager in Poland has seen Islamophobic hate speech on the internet uh, uh, in 2016. So within two years, you have such a, a change, which um, uh, the, the, the change shows that, that we are more and more immersed in that. So we have uh, increasing number of hate speech uh, in the media, uh, also in the TV, uh, but particularly in um, online uh, media. Uh, and uh, the most scary uh, thing that we found in this uh, research was, this is one example of, of, um, uh, of uh, hate speech that we presented to our participants. You can, you can read it, I don't want to read it because it's really an awful, um, awful um, hateful statement. Uh, and we uh, asked our participants whether they consider this statement to be offensive on a scale from one to five. And I want to show you now just people who say that this statement is definitely offensive. In 2014, uh, two thirds of uh, adult participants and two thirds of young participants, so approximately 60% of Polish adults and of Polish um, uh, young people would say, this statement is clearly an offensive statement. This is hate speech. In 2016, already less than half of the adults, less than 50% of the adults that consider this statement to be offensive and only one third of young people would consider this statement to be offensive. And this inspired our research looking into how people get used to hate speech, how people stop considering hate speech really offensive, that they, they stop uh, reacting emotionally to hate speech. They just think it's something absolutely normal. Uh, and, and this is what I wanted to present you now, showing you some studies that we've done on that topic. So our concept was that when people have more contact with hate speech, they, their sensitivity to hate speech decreases. They, they, they stop recognizing hate speech as something offensive. Uh, they stop reacting emotionally to hate speech. And this, is, this comes from very classic studies of aggression, uh, in which we know that when people are very often exposed to aggression, their sensitivity to aggression decreases. And this in turn, when you, when you lose your sensitivity to, to hate speech, uh, you can start using hate speech because it's something normal to you. It of course affects your, your attitudes. You, you, are, you become more prejudiced. You accept discrimination because uh, there's nothing wrong with hate speech, then probably the, 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 the content of this hate speech is uh, true. And then also it allows you to become more violent in your everyday life. And this is something we actually found in, in, in our in different studies. This is a study, a large survey that we've done uh, in, in Poland uh, in which we basically found this effect that people who are more exposed to hate speech, so when we presented them with an examples of hate speech and we asked them how often do they see that, so the more a given person sees, uh, declares that he or she has seen uh, such uh, um, hate speech frequently, the less sensitive the person is to hate speech, the less person would consider that this is really an offensive language. And this in turn makes that person more prejudiced, right? Uh, and also we found that it affects anti-immigrant attitudes, which we measured in a very, very harsh way. So we asked, for example, would you accept um, uh, to violations of human rights in case of, of, for example, interrogation of immigrants? If there are refugees and immigrants coming from a war zone, do you think uh, they can be tortured? 
uh, uh, by uh, the state police uh, in order to gain important information before they get accepted to get the country. So the more people are exposed to hate speech, the less sensitive they become to hate speech. And this makes them in turn accept all these harsh forms of treatment of immigrants. Um, another study that we've done on that topic used uh, an experimental procedure, which we designed uh, several years ago, and we've been using that uh, in different contexts and in different studies. So the procedure is actually with, this is, this is, these were studies conducted with, with student samples, where we asked, where we invited students to a laboratory. Students were sitting in front of the computer. And first we created an exposure phase. So we presented students with a set of comments from uh, an online news website. And in one condition, this set of comments included a lot of hate speech. In the second condition, it included, included many negative comments, but not being related to hate speech. So they were not negative about minorities, that were not negative about immigrants, they were just uh, you know, people being uh, very upset with their politicians, being aggressive about celebrities and so on, but not particularly uh, about any social groups. Um, and we presented this uh, to our participants as, as a cognitive study in which we are looking on how, uh, how people are able to process and remember uh, comment sections when they are written in different fonts and different formats. So, these comments were presented uh, sometimes in blue, sometimes in white, sometimes in red, and we were uh, then uh, doing some fake recall tasks for, for the participants. So uh, basically they were thinking it's, it's, it's a task about remembering, uh, remembering comments from the internet. So they were not focusing particularly on the fact that they are exposed to, to, to hate speech or not. And then after this long phase of exposure, we came back to these two groups of our participants and we presented them with a list of hate speech sentences that were not presented to them before. And we asked them whether they consider these sentences to be offensive or not. So, right, we have two groups of, of, of people. One group has been presented, one, one group was exposed to hate speech for a long time. The second was not exposed to hate speech for a long time. And then in the end, we present them examples of hate speech and ask them, are these statements offensive or not? And in the end, we measured their pre prejudice. So after, after that, we measured whether they would accept certain immigrant minority groups as their neighbors, as their workers, or as family members. And this is what we found. The people who are, uh, who, the people whom we exposed to hate speech, so people whom we presented for a long time, who, 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 whom we asked to read hate speech for a long time, became less sensitive to hate speech. So they, after that kind of training, when they have seen hate speech, they stopped considering it offensive anymore. And this in turn led to higher prejudice towards different outgroups. So we asked them about different minority groups. And so, so they become in the end more prejudiced than the group whom we did not expose to hate speech. So you can see that even in such an experimental study, you can show that it's not just a correlation that is basically a cause and effect that when you present a lot of hate speech to people, in the end, they stop being sensitive to that and they become more prejudiced. Um, additionally to that, um, we wanted to see also what are the emotional consequences of hate speech. So what kind of emotions are, are generated by the fact that people are exposed to hate speech. So we repeated a very similar experiment. So in one condition, people were exposed to hate speech for a long time. This is something normal, so people who are actually spending a lot of time on the internet, they would be exposed to hate speech anyway. And in the second group, we exposed people to other comments that did not include, include hate speech. And then we had a me measurement phase. Again, we presented participants with a set uh, of, of statements. And the difference between this study and the previous study was that we were trying to capture what is the emotional reaction of people when they are watching these statements. So whether they, start experiencing certain emotions. And the emotions we observed from coding their facial affect. So we recorded their facial reactions when they were reading, uh, when they were reading examples of, of hate speech. And uh, so this is how it looks like. So you, you basically observe people when they're reading something and you can 
analyze um, at kind of on, in an online way, you can analyze which emotions appear, like joy, sad, sadness, surprise, anger, based on the micro expressions of, of, of face. So basically it's about, it's about muscular reactions, right? Whether the zygomaticus muscle is, is, is activated or, uh, or frontalis muscle, from that actually you can judge whether a person feels certain emotion. So basically, we found that when people are reading um, hate speech, the uh, most common emotions that we have observed were emotions of anger, contempt, uh, but also sadness at some people. And uh, the most important, however, was the analysis in which we compared people who we presented with a lot of um, examples of hate speech before. So the experimental group, these are people who have, were exposed to, to hate speech for a long time, and the control group whom we didn't uh, expose to hate speech. What happens with them when they suddenly become exposed to hate speech in the end? So people from experimental groups, so people whom we exposed to hate speech for a long time, we found particularly that what, what you can see is the increase in the emotion of contempt. And what was really surprising to us, the increase in the emotion of joy. So they suddenly, the hate speech uh, generates enjoyment in them rather than any negative emotions. And also it generates contempt, contempt toward, uh, uh, toward uh, um, uh, we thought that it's basically contempt towards the, the objects of, of hate speech, towards the people who are described towards minority groups. And um, then we tested that in another survey study, uh, which we actually reused, we used this, this previous study of adolescents that I presented to you uh, that we've done in 2016, um, and also uh, we wanted to see whether the usage of um, uh, hate speech can be also somehow caused by certain emotions. And this is the model which we found there. It was that basically we found that people who are more exposed to hate speech, so who see more hate speech in their environment, they are more inclined to use hate speech. And there are several emotional mediators of that, but the most important ones are anger and contempt. So the more people are exposed to hate speech, the more angry there are towards minority groups and the more contempt they feel uh, towards minority groups. And this in turn makes them use hate speech in their everyday life more often. Uh, we were quite surprised that this is not the case of hate. So actually hate speech should not be called hate speech. It's rather a speech of contempt because it's, it's, it's more about contempt towards certain minority groups rather than hate. Uh, I don't want to go very deep into this uh, differentiation, but basically hate is more an uh, emotion. Hate in certain cases can be productive, can be, um, can be uh, even adaptive. Contempt is a purely negative emotion, which directly leads to discrimination and to, uh, and, and to discrimination of, of, of minorities and immigrants. So to sum it up, we, uh, we observed in this research three kinds of processes. Uh, first process was a behavioral process. So uh, when people see a lot of hate speech, they become desensitized to derogatory language. They, they stop being sensitive to it. They stop considering this to be offensive anymore. And this makes them use hate speech and this increases their prejudice. The second category of reactions are reactions which we consider no, uh, normative ones. So when people see a lot of hate speech in their environment, they start thinking it is a norm. It is, it is how other people are behaving. So it is, if this is a norm, then I also can use such language. So this, therefore, this is also brings a higher frequency of use and increases the prejudice. And finally, it also have emotional processes involved. So when people see a lot of hate speech, it increases certain emotions that they feel toward minority groups that are transmitted by hate speech. And this, uh, alters the emotional reactions to these um, to this, to, to this minorities. So for example, from the emotion of empathy, when the, the people feel when they see uh, a minority person suffering, uh, they would rather feel contempt and the emotion of empathy is blocked. Uh, we also did some, some modeling analysis and I, I, we, you could read more about that in our articles in Advances in Political Psychology where we did some uh, agent-based models showing how when we take these three changes, this desensitization, the normative process and the emotional process, and we try to model how the behavior of individuals change, 
we actually can find in a, in a dynamic pattern that at certain point, the, uh, the, the dominance, the hate speech becomes, so the black, black dots here uh, denote uh, hate speech occurrences in a certain society. So even in this artificial society, in this artificial kind of network which we created, we find that the, that the hate speech will dominate. So it's, it's basically like an epidemic uh, that, that happens in, in, in the media through these three different emotional process, uh, the different psychological processes. And now I wanted to focus on a different side of that. So I was I was talking about about majorities and how the, the views of majorities are, are 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 being altered and changed because of hate speech. But how does it change the situation of minorities? Um, I want to start from one case, the case of uh, Poland and one uh, minority group in Poland. So in Poland, as in many other places in Europe, in 2015 we had a lot of uh, anti uh, immigrant rallies. So this is an, an, an far-right uh, uh, far right, uh, uh, rally, um, uh, one of many like that in 2015, with people with the banner saying no to the Islamization of Poland, being against the Islamization. This was purely anti-Muslim, anti but not only anti-Muslim. If you go to Wrocław, during the uh, anti-immigration um, anti rally in Wrocław, somebody brings an effigy presenting a Hasidic Jew, a very traditionally dressed Jew with a beard, with, with uh, side curls, with a pure hat. And the person burned this effigy. When later on he was asked uh, uh, during the trial, why did he uh, bring such an effigy? Why did he do that? He said that this was because he wanted to represent George Soros. Uh, George Soros, who's, uh, who, who for them represents the ultimate enemy and somebody who actually brought immigrants to Europe. Of course, this is absurd because George Soros never, uh, never wore the traditional uh, Hasidic uh, uniform, so it was clearly an anti-Semitic uh, anti uh, uh, expression. But we could really see that in times of large anti-immigration, uh, um, large wave of, of anti-immigration sentiments in Poland, you have suddenly an, a lot of anti-Semitic incidents, anti-Jewish incidents as well. Uh, and this is what we actually uh, also see in the research. We asked people and, and many um, opinion polls, uh, polling institutions in Poland, asked the questions about social, social distance. So for example, would you accept having an Israeli or Jewish uh, uh, family member if you hear that you're a uh, daughter uh, brings her boyfriend and uh, she tells you that she wants to marry him and he's Jewish. Would you accept that or not? So what's the percentage of Poles who are against uh, accepting such uh, um, you know, a Jewish person becoming a family member? In 2001, this were 32% of Polish people who say, I would not accept it. I would oppose uh, a Jewish person becoming a member of my family. And then in 2004, 2006, 2007, all the time between 30 and 40% uh, of people who uh, declared that they would oppose uh, having a Jewish person in their family. Now, something very important happens in 2014 and 2016 when these numbers are rising up to more than 50%. So the majority of the population declares they would not accept a Jewish person in their family. So it all uh, happens around the time when we see a rise in Islamophobia, a rise in anti-Muslim uh, anti uh, prejudice in Poland. And we can also see it in a more quantified way when we compare the, the surveys that we've done in 2014 and 2016. So in this survey, we found that there is an increasing distance to Jews, right? So uh, in 2016, people declared that they, will, they would not accept Jewish people in their close environment much more than they did in 2014. And this change in time can be explained by the increase in Islamophobia. Among all other mediators that we tested, we found that actually Islamophobia is driving this effect. So it's actually the fact that uh, media, the politicians have uh, created this uh, Islamophobic atmosphere in Poland uh, in, in 2014, 2015 and 2016 it also has this spillover effect, so it led to higher distance toward Jewish people. 
Um, and uh, then, of course, this uh, uh, hatred against Jews will, could be observed also in, in other periods of time. And Anna already um, uh, uh, presented this, uh, um, um, reminded us about 2018 and the time that we had this debate around the so-called Holocaust law. Uh, uh, Poland tried to introduce a new law which would make it um, uh, illegal to, to, to um, uh, blame uh, uh, Poles for... Uh, uh, committing uh, uh, war crimes and crimes of genocide. And then, of course, there was an opposition of, 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 of many people, of many intellectuals, scholars, but also Jewish communities who were against uh, uh, such uh, penal penalizing of, um, uh, of, of history. And um, this is, an, an, and this is a, an example of um, a, um, a weekly magazine uh, saying attack on Poland, right? Implying that Jewish people attack attack Poland, that they do not accept uh, uh, Polish law. Uh, and then there is a journalist, uh, one of the very prominent uh, uh, right-wing journalists who uses uh, purely anti-Semitic uh, terms in his expressions on, uh, on, on Twitter when talking about uh, Jews, the kind of words which were not used in Polish, uh, uh, um, uh, in Polish uh, public uh, life since pre-war times probably. So uh, also you could see a lot of cartoons in, in the newspapers presenting, like, like uh, in this case, this was a cartoon by Mr. Uh, uh, Cesario Krzysztofa, a cartoonist uh, from Tygodnik Solidarność and Dorzeczy, who also created this cartoon, Polish Holocaust, where he presented um, um, Jews uh, as being responsible for killing of Poles during the war. So you can see this guy with the red, the Star of David, which is, uh, you know, it's like a red star, but it's a Star of David, so implying that, that all Jews are responsible for the Holocaust of Polish people. Right? So this, is, this was the, uh, the kind, of, the kind of, of, of rhetoric which was used there. And this is what we found when looking on um, the Google searches. So we look, how often do Polish people uh, look for certain derogatory labels, for certain derogatory words about Jewish people? So these are true three uh, anti-Semitic words. And you can see that they almost do not, I mean, the, their appearances in 2017 is relatively rare. And then in 2018, they become more often searched for by, uh, by Polish users of Google. And the same we find uh, when analyzing Twitter and Facebook that uh, these derogatory words describing Jews were relatively not common still in January 2018. And then after January and February, you can see this in this this spikes when when people are 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 more often using this this uh, derogatory language about Jews. This is also this can be also seen in comparative studies. So, for example, this is one study in which I was involved uh, uh, in in Poland, and this was uh, a study where we collected data from uh, several countries. And um, in this study, we asked, for example. Uh, whether people have heard, uh, so the study was conducted on, on Jewish uh, minorities. So we, um, we conducted study on Jewish communities in different countries. So there were several hundreds of, uh, uh, of um, Jewish people in each given, in each country in, in Europe. And we asked the Jewish people, how often have you heard anti-Semitic comments in political discussions in, in your country? And uh, you can see that in Poland, 47% of people have heard anti-Semitic comments in political discussions within last year. In the United Kingdom, 44%. This was the time when, when, when um, Labour Party leader uh, used uh, uh, some, some anti-Semitic rhetoric. So the study comes to, is from 2018. And in Hungary, 41%. In, in other countries, slightly less. Uh, also, uh, we asked whether uh, people have heard uh, during last year uh, uh, a statement that Jews have too much power in our country. Have you heard such statement uh, in, uh, in your country within last year? And you can see here also that in Poland, 89% of Jewish people have heard such statement within last year. In Hungary, almost the same, but also quite often in France. In France, more than 80% of, of surveyed French Jews would say that they have heard such language. And um, we looked also on uh, uh, the declarations of emigration intention because we wanted to see whether people are whether Jewish people are basically emigrating from a country in which they see they are not welcomed, right? 
So uh, we founded actually this intention, active preparation to emigration can be well explained by the fact that the person has heard a lot of hate speech in her or, he or his environment. So people, Jewish people who are hearing a lot of hate speech in their environment are more often thinking and considering emigrating from their country. And this is uh, quite obvious, but the most striking thing in this analysis was that the effect of hate speech on emigration was stronger than the effect of crime level in the home country, uh, in the country where, where, where people live, where Jewish people live, the level of un unemployment, immigration, or the corruption of, of, of government. And this is made on the sample, on the whole uh, European sample. So you can see that you would probably say that if the government is corrupt, if there is a, a lot of, uh, I don't know, maybe Muslim immigrants in the country, if there's a high unemployment, and there's a lot of crime, then Jewish people would think, maybe I should consider another country to, 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 to live. But in fact, it's not like that. I mean, th th these effects are relatively modest. They are not very strong. The, the strongest one is the effect of hate speech, because this gives an impression that you're not really welcome in the country. And you start thinking that maybe after hate speech, the aggressive acts or acts of discrimination might appear. And this is not only about Jewish people. We did very similar studies um, in, um, in other um, contexts, and we find also that, 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 uh, that hate speech has very, very serious psychological consequences. So, for example, we did a study on international students of the University of Warsaw. So we had 1,000 international students who are at the University of Warsaw coming from all around the world. Uh, they are coming from, from, from Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, but also from the Western Europe, coming on Erasmus exchanges, uh, students from Arab countries, from African countries. And uh, we uh, measured uh, to the experiences of hate speech. How often do, uh, do they encounter hate speech in their environment in, when they are in Poland? And we, um, we measured their mood. Uh, and we measured their psychological well-being, so the, the level of happiness, but we also measured their level of PTSD, of post-traumatic stress. So we found that the students who have been exposed to hate speech have more negative mood than students who are not exposed to hate speech. Their psychological well-being is lower, and also they react with more uh, higher levels of post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, and we, we have more uh, and other studies on different on, on gay community looking at the same um, uh, that, that, that hate speech uh, uh, brings uh, higher levels of depression among gay people uh, and uh, also among two large minority groups, uh, WAMCO uh, minority and people who live in Vila Movica. And now we have results on of the study on Ukrainian immigrants in Poland. We have very large Ukrainian immigration in Poland, more than one million Ukrainian people who came in recent years to Poland. And in all of these groups, we see that the more people are exposed to hate speech, the higher levels of depression they have, the lower psychological well-being, and, and higher levels of, of post-traumatic stress disorder. So now the final question which I wanted to address today is what can be done? How can we confront hate speech? The first thing which I would like to propose as a, as a good way to, 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 to deal with hate speech is raising empathy. This is a campaign um, uh, Anna Zieska mentioned the, um, uh, the, the Pauline Museum, the Jewish Museum in Warsaw. And some time ago, uh, the Jewish Museum in Warsaw had an, a, a organized a campaign on the internet where they asked uh, some uh, not, notable uh, uh, members of the uh, Jewish community in Poland to read themselves the hate speech that they found on the internet. So they gave them examples of hate speech from the comments uh, from, from social media or from news websites. And they asked uh, uh, participants to read uh, this hate speech. Uh, uh, they asked, not participants, they asked uh, um, uh, the, those Jewish uh, people, for example, here, the journalist, uh, Sebegen Blomstein from Gazeta Wyborcza, who actually lived in France for many years. And uh, he, he was asked to, to, to read these this hateful statements. And you can see on his face how he's reacting, how sad he becomes when reading these slurs about himself, about, about, about his ethnic group. And this was a campaign aiming at, at, at um, 
at, at inducing empathy. And uh, we wanted to see in our, our research also how effective are these kinds of campaigns. So um, we did one study in collaboration with an organization which is working with uh, the integration of, of, of refugees in Poland. And uh, we had two conditions. So in one condition, people were watching an, a, a movie which was a discussion between, um, uh, between uh, um, an alpinist uh, and uh, a journalist. So it was a completely random, random discussion. And then we had uh, the second condition in which we presented participants with an interview uh, of a, a Polish person who actually holds uh, quite negative opinions about immigrants with a refugee who came to Poland. And these were a group of different refugees, but uh, these were uh, Muslim refugees who came to Poland either from, uh, from Bosnia during the war in Bosnia or from Chechnya. Um, and uh, they were telling their stories in a very uh, personal way and also expressing a lot of emotions about their experience when they came to Poland. And then again, what we did, we presented participants after showing them this, these movements, we presented participants with examples of hate speech. And we asked them um, about those hate speech. So when we looked whether they're sensitive to hate. And this is what we found that People who have seen this empathizing hate speech, the hate speech which involves a contact, vicarious contact with a refugee person, they in fact felt much more empathy toward refugees than those people who have seen a random, random movie, a control movie. And this in turn make them, made them more sensitive to hate speech. So they started considering online hate speech as more hateful, as more aggressive. And also they, they started uh, uh, supporting the idea to prohibit hate speech. And they also said that they will not use hate speech anymore in their, in their everyday life. So it seems that by raising empathy, you actually can affect, uh, uh, can resensitize people. They can start becoming sensitive again to, to hate speech. And this might have positive consequences. Another thing are counter comments. Uh, so um, I presented, I started this presentation today from this article from Fox News, and I showed you some uh, examples of uh, aggressive comments below this article. But these were not the only comments, because one person wrote something like that. Are the vile comments here about the death of 500 human beings while trying to escape for a better, to a better life really indicative of the average regular follower of Fox News? If so, no wonder this country is becoming a moral cesspool. And uh, uh, it has nothing to do with gays getting married. You all like what you see in the mirror. So you can see that somebody tried to raise some emotions and try to confront those people who are, uh, who, um, are users, uh, who are, are, are producing this, uh, this uh, hateful comment. So uh, actually now I want to present you one study in which we wanted to see whether confrontation with haters can actually reduce the level of haters they produce. So uh, this is an intervention which uh, I've done in collaboration with um, Samurai Labs, which is a startup company uh, working on art artificial intelligence. And they are producing uh, conversational bots. So they basically use bots or artificial accounts uh, that can be used for different reasons uh, uh, using um, that they are, these are basically robots that are pr producing uh, uh, language and, and, and uh, can robots that can engage in conversation. So we created such a robot, we called the, 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 the robot James, and James was engaging in interaction on a very hateful uh, website, uh, a hateful channel on Reddit. So I read it, uh, the, the, the hateful ch channel is called uh, Men's Rights. It's a, it's a misogynist, uh, um, uh, misogynist uh, uh, website. And the, the bot was reacting whenever uh, uh, it encountered an offensive language. So uh, when there was an uh, off offensive language, the robot would react and saying something like that, let's say, I got how you feel, but on top of this, I was astonished when I realized we take commenting online for granted when actually it is a craft which should be mastered. Or fellow Redditors, 
above deliberations could be more fruitful if we would not call each other dambas. I mean, that's just some examples of how he was reacting. So he's trying to tone down the discussion and reduce the violent language that, 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 the, that it has encountered. And uh, there were four kind of modes in which the boat was reacting. Uh, the disapproval message, so the boat was disapproving the, the, the content which he uh, has encountered. Uh, Norm-inducing message, so uh, he was referring to norms. He was saying it is not accepted here. Here on Reddit, we do not accept such kind of language. Or empathizing language in which the boat was basically trying to say, think about how the victim has feel, is feeling about your words. And what we were analyzing here was the amount of hate speech which was produced by certain user before encountering the bot and after the encountering the bot. And we also had a control group, which we just measured one month before and one month after without such an intervention. So people who were not, not confronted with the bot. So in the control condition, you see there is no change basically. But all of these people who have confronted this, this fake account that was reacting to their hatred, a month later, they produced significantly less hate speech than people who have not, uh, than, than they did before, uh, before being confronted by, by this artificial account. So it seems that really uh, such an artificial account was acting like a normal user could do, but we are very, very rarely reacting like that. When we are hearing hate speech on, on, on Twitter or on Reddit, we are usually saying, okay, that's, 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 the, that, that's the norm of this media. So why should we react? Now, if we react, there is a really high chance that the person whom we will criticize, whom we will, uh, uh, with whom we will communicate, will ultimately decrease uh, or change his or her uh, way of expressing on, 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 on internet um, in the future. Uh, another thing you can do is you can flag contents and on all, all websites, like for example, here in the case of YouTube, you have this flagging, right? The, the flag where, where you can, you see an, an Islamophobic content and you can, you can flag it. Now the problem with it is that it's not really effective. And this is uh, uh, a report from the European Union, uh, uh, European Commission uh, uh, report where they were looking how often um, Facebook or Twitter or YouTube is reacting to such uh, uh, to such feedback, and uh, uh, they found that actually in case of Facebook, 90% of times when they get get something, they react. It doesn't mean that they ban uh, 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 the person whose who, whose behavior is reported, but any reaction happens. In case of Twitter, when they when when they get a report from a general user that somebody violated the norms, it's only 40, 45% of such, uh, of such reports get any feedback from Twitter. In case of YouTube, it's really bad because it's only 12% of uh, people who would get any feedback from YouTube when they report hate speech on YouTube. So it seems that um, it is really not effective. In, in case of many social media, flagging is, is not really affecting. They are not really uh, taking it down. A good example is uh, Donald Trump. His account has been taken down by the Twitter and other social media two days ago, after so many years of him producing extremely offensive language. So it's only when they are sure that he will be um, uh, he will not be a president anymore, they decide to to to, to react in a in a um, more uh, uh, decisive way. And the final thing is the role of authority. And um, it reminds me about one uh, issue that you might remember for in France, when one of the members of the Yellow Vest uh, uh, movement in France uh, attacked uh, uh, philosopher uh, Alain Finkielkraut, uh, who, uh, and, and this attack was based purely on, on, on anti-Semitic uh, basis. So Finkielkraut, was, at, uh, Finkielkraut was, was attacked. Of course, the basis of this was political because Finkielkraut was, was you know, on, Relatively on the right wing and, and, and not agreeing with the with the, with the yellow vest movement, but the way it was expressed was purely anti-Semitic. That person uh, told Finkelkraut to to go to Israel basically and not not interfere in, in French politics. And then there was a very strong statement by President Emmanuel Macron, 
which was very interesting because Macron probably is not an ally of, you know, he, I mean, he was not, uh, you know, involved in that process very much, but he reacted very strongly, uh, 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 stressing the fact that, and I think recalled the fact that he's, he's um, a French academic, regardless of whether he's an immigrant, a child of an immigrant, etc., he has to be respected. And there is no, the, the, this will never be, the, the hate speech toward, toward people in France would never be accepted. And this was uh, at that time, when you think about how important is this reaction, I, I don't want to go now in this line of studies that we've been doing, but we found that uh, a very important thing when reacting to hate speech is uh, uh, the behavior of people who are authoritarian. Because it seems that people who are authoritarian they're very much looking to their authorities, to those people who are in power, to the governments. So those people who are authoritarian, if um, the authorities are against hate speech, the authoritarian people, right-wing authoritarians, would also be against hate speech. If the authorities are supportive to hate speech, or if they are silent, right-wing authoritarians will be prejudiced. And um, this is uh, something I, I, I don't want to talk about, but basically, uh, this is uh, something which we, we found in our research, uh, a lot of evidence for that, that the behavior of leaders is, is extremely essential in how the followers will, will react to hate speech. And uh, a final study that we've been doing uh, some time ago was about, uh, uh, Islam, uh, about homophobia and about gay people. In Poland, we had several cases of young people who committed suicide after being uh, bullied by um, by um, homophobic haters in their schools, and also uh, being offended in the media, in their environment, on the basis of, 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 of their homosexuality. And what we found in a big survey that we've done on, uh, on a large sample of, uh, of uh, gay people uh, in Poland, uh, gay and gays and lesbians, uh, bisexuals and, and transgender people, is uh, that we found that the more uh, they are exposed to hate speech, the higher level of depressions you can observe in that group. And also the more they are exposed to hate speech, the higher, the more probably they will also think and consider suicide. So hate speech can translate into, into mental health in a very severe way. But one important moderator, which we find here also in that study is that we ask them whether they feel accepted, whether they feel that their, uh, their identity is accepted by their family members. We ask those gay people, uh, how many of their family members, like the parents, uh, siblings, how many of them accept the fact that they are gay or lesbian or tra transsexual? And we found that for those people who have most of their families accepting them, for those of them, hate speech does not produce higher level of depressions and it does not produce uh, uh, suicidal, uh, suicidal thoughts. For those people, the gray ones, for those people who are uh, not accepted by their families, if, if their family doesn't accept their, the fact that they are LGBT, then hate speech leads to suicide and leads to depression. So basically, it shows that it's also so essential that you have a supportive environment. If you have a supportive environment around yourself that accepts your identity, then it generates a kind of a shield that uh, protects you from the hate speech, which you can hear in the media, which you can hear from politicians, which you can hear from your school uh, peers. Um, um, and, and, and this is a kind of, of, of social cure against, uh, against hate. I would like to thank you now, and I, I, I will, I'm, I'm very uh, open to your comments.